Up next on All About Android, Florence Ion and I sit down with Steph Cuthbertson and Chet Haas, both from the Google Android team, to talk all about the big announcements at Google I.O. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect qualified candidates. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. And by Cashfly, give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN, content delivery network, and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by LegalZoom. Check out LegalZoom today to see how they can make life better for you and your business. Visit LegalZoom.com and enter AAA at checkout for special savings. Hello, welcome to All About Android, episode 419, recorded on Wednesday, May 8th, 2019. We're your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. I'm Florence Ion. And we are at the Google campus. We always love this time of year. We come to Google I.O., we have a great time. Everybody talks about what the dessert's going to be named. And then, probably the highlight of my year is I get to sit down with the folks, with Flo and the folks from Google, uh, to talk about the thing that we nerd, about, nerd out about each and every week on the show. Of course, returning for the third year, this, we're so delighted to have you back, Stephanie Cuthbertson, Senior Director for Android. Welcome back, Steph. Thank you for having me again. It's really nice to see you. Absolutely. What watch are you wearing? It's very sparkly. Uh, this is the Kate Spade. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, also joining us for the first time first here time. in the room, Chet Haas, developer advocate for Android. And yes. Chet, I'm super delighted to have you here today. I'm Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I did not bring any slides for, for you to make your way through a speechless um, I'll, I'll, I'll have stage to, I'll presentation. Have to and on the other hand, I didn't bring a Kate Spade. I brought. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got one that looks kind of similar. The, yours is dark mode. Mine is normal. Yes. Exactly. So, We're all about dark mode this year. Uh, yeah, big time. We're oh, definitely yeah. going to talk about that. Why don't we start with a little bit of a recap? Of course, you both were on uh, on stage yesterday. The big keynote, yeah. Steph, you were in the, the the first keynote, and then Chet, the second keynote, more focused on developers. Maybe we'll start off with kind of the things that you're most excited about. Maybe like a quick recap mm -hmm. of kind of the the overall the overarching focus of Android Q or 10. Sure. Yeah. It was uh, you know it's a, a really big set of milestones for Android. It was it was really fun to do it in the amphitheater with everyone there to talk about you know look it's version 10 of Android which people know about but they I think most people did not know we'd be announcing that we had 2.5 billion active devices quite a milestone absolutely uh, and I think as we're as we're looking ahead to the years that are coming Q really kind of sets the frame for what's ahead uh, we talked about three big themes yesterday I think the uh, the first one we talked about was innovation and there you can really see uh, Q you know the, I think the way we talked about it is just shaping the leading edge of mobile and the way I think about it is you've I just got this incredible ecosystem on Android. I'll never forget being at the Hong Kong Summit uh, with all of our incredible OEM partners and just watching what's coming. There's been so many firsts on Android which are driven by that group. We talked about just a few of them, but things, everything from OLED display, high density, large screen. Uh, well, we can talk more about all this, but uh, it's just been amazing to see how that uh, group of OEMs has propelled Android. And what you see now is just this, this next big wave of innovation coming. I think foldables really have the potential to reshape the uh, reshape how people think about mobile. Literally. Uh, yes. <laughs> 5G is just incredible. I think we're really excited to see what developers are going to do on 5G. I mean, just imagine a phone that's connected with that kind of low latency connection. We should definitely talk more about 5G. The technology behind it is super exciting. Uh, uh, the uh, ML-driven advances and the way they're done in such a privacy-first way is probably uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart. It's something I think the team is really excited about as well. So innovation 
we talked a lot about that. Security and privacy, though, is definitely the central focus of the release. That is the bulk of Android Q. And that is a, uh, just kind of a continuation of a very long-standing commitment. I think it's a, a, quite a proud moment for the team to be able to talk about Gartner, industry analysts like Gartner saying, mm -hmm. uh, look, Here's uh, Android, the uh, latest Android version is the highest possible rating on 26 out of 30 counts. Uh, if you read the report, and it's definitely a great report to dive into, uh, Android is the leading operating system uh, and it leads uh, on a number of points from things like kernel integrity to authentication to network security. Uh, and I think the team is really proud of the just the achievement and kind of the time that's gone into that as well as what it means for users. And we, uh, throughout the day yesterday and over IO, we'll talk a lot about all the security and privacy enhancements and we can talk more about that today, but that was just a huge focus for the team. Um, digital well-being too is another, that's a multi-year initiative for us. And the, um, the moment uh, yesterday was really satisfying to be able to talk about how much that's helping people. Some of the new tools, and one of my personal favorites is wind down mode and seeing people be able to set down the phone at I night. I turn it off every night. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, not, not yes. ready, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're an aspirational wind I'm down. An yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but I, with digital well-being, I think our, our goal is really to help people find balance. I think if, I, if you peel back 10 years ago, people uh, were at that time thinking like, wow, phones are really yeah. cool. But if you look now, fast forward, people are carrying them everywhere. They're on them all the time. And so it's a, a, a new set of things people are asking for help for, which is really like, look, help me, help me set the right boundaries so that I can find balance. Um, so I think uh, seeing the, just how people are leveraging those tools is really great. And I, I do really think if people haven't tried them, I definitely would encourage them. I personally uh, find wind down mode to be one of my, my favorites. Um, but I think some of the new things coming are also really cool. Seeing something like Family Link, which takes those same concept of digital well-being and extends it to families to give parents the kind of um, uh, uh, parental controls that you want. Uh, something like being able to set uh, 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 device bedtime and say, all right, you're done mm -hmm. for the night. Or just to kind of say, this is the amount of time you get to spend on a device. Those are really wonderful tools for parents. So I think we're, we're pretty excited about this year. We're really excited about this year. It's a very big year and a very big release. And Family Link, that's yeah. going to be built into the system settings. So you no longer have to yeah. go into the Play Store and yeah. download yeah. it. It's like, I got this phone. There's a kid nearby. <laughs> yeah, there's a kid. I there's think it's kid. mine. Yeah, you gotta. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, it's it's true. So the the Family Link uh, features have been available several of them for a while. Yeah, and I think the advantage of that is it's given us a lot of feedback, so we can right. iterate on those with families. But yes, now they'll they're in the top level in settings, so you can open up your settings, and there's a menu, digital well-being, and uh, Family Link. You can go in there, and then there are those additional features we've added too, things like. Uh, uh, app timers for specific apps, yeah. uh, which I think is really great. Let's say, hypothetically, there's an app or a game your child is spending a lot of time in. You can say, look, this is the limit of the time I want to spend. Uh, uh, bonus time is definitely one of the things the team thought was It's the carrot great. and the stick. <laughs> yes. Right? It's more like um, a time in than a time yes. out. Yes. Right, right. So uh, I think something like, you know, bonus time is just great to be able to say, like, look, all right, yes, you can have five more minutes. Yeah, like but, thinking, thinking back in my use, because I use Family Link every single weekend. The kids get their tablets on the weekend. That's uh -huh. kind of their, mm -hmm. their tablet time. Yeah. And uh, very, you know, very familiar with going into each profile and bumping up 15 minutes or bumping up a half an hour because, dang it, we need to get our budget done. Mm -hmm. This is the only way it's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, so it's really nice. I would love some sort of unify, way to unify between multiple profiles, though. Okay. To be able to say, like, pause everyone with a single tap instead of having to go into each individual one or add 15 minutes to both, something like that. Oh, this is the feature request podcast. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I like to get them in when I can. And yeah. then when they happen, I'm like, hey, it, it worked. <laughs> Plant the seed. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. But anyways. Uh, yeah, I, I love what you guys are doing with the uh, digital well-being and Family Link, especially because you use that all the time. Yeah, I feel like that's a good segue to yeah. ask about uh, focus mode. Yeah. yeah. Be, so for the adults yeah. uh, who need help, yeah. you know, from their phone, how is that <laughs> like kind of different from what we have now? So like, what I do now is I do D and D, and then mm -hmm. I have a faves list. Yeah. But still, the faves yeah. are the BFFs, and they come through, and it's like not right now. So what's yeah. kind of what's like the difference? between those two? That's a great question. I think the, um, you can think of it as a kind of a continuum depending on how, 
how focused you want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, if you're all the way out, you're just at a place that you're like, look, I really don't want to be disturbed right now. I'm at home. I'm having like in a special moment with my family. Maybe just the only person I want to get a hold of me is, you know, person X, Y, and Z. The way I think about that is, uh, uh, for me, I've got twins which usually means uh, I'd like we'll often take one of the twins out and uh, I'll take one of them for dinner just so mm -hmm, we can have some special mm -hmm. time. And uh, it's a great, uh, it's, I don't want to be disturbed. I don't want to talk to anyone except the problem is if you have twins, if one of them is in front of you, the other one is usually getting in trouble somewhere. So I will still want my husband to be able to get a hold of me. Uh, so for me, I'll flip on do not disturb and my husband can always get a hold of me. So I think of that as kind of like really focused time. Uh, like do not disturb, like I'm just really here in this moment. Uh, the, the focus mode feature is for something different. I think of that as like, uh, so when I was writing the keynote, I was down in a, parts of it in a coffee shop, uh, actually in Santa Cruz, there's a bakery that's one of my favorites. And for me, I tend to get, let's admit, I get distracted by a few things, like some of us. Uh, sure. And so for me, I wanted to be able to just kind of turn off the couple of apps that I find distracting so that I can just uh, uh, focus and spend time on what I'm doing. Uh, but I still wanted to have access to my phone because I'm you know, looking up stats and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's, a, it's really just kind of a different, a different mode for working. Above all, the, really the, uh, the goal of what we're trying to do is to help people have access to the technology that mobile gives you, but uh, to be able to control the technology so that you can work without distraction. So it's, that's, the, that's the core goal. Yeah. yeah. To put that to use. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you heard from users as far as like the V... Let me, let me take a step back. When it comes to security, privacy, and responsible tech use, which has been very largely in the minds of people in the last couple of years, sometimes I wonder, I, I question myself, whether this is a drumbeat that's, that's being made more by, like us, people in the press talking about this stuff versus actual users out there using these features asking for them and actually using them. Have you heard from a lot of, like, what has been the uptake on users on some of these use your device less uh, functionalities uh, that, that are being offered in digital well-being? Are, is this what people are asking for? Yes, it's a great question. I think the, uh, the right way to think about building an operating system is to think about, well, what do our users want? Yeah. And so that's where we spent our time. Uh, we do a lot of user studies, we do a lot of user, we do a lot of research around digital well-being. That's what drove focus mode. And uh, yeah, we are seeing for, for the users who use the features, they're saying it is really helping them to set boundaries, right. uh, helping them to define the boundaries they want to set and then kind of stay within them. So yeah. that's been really, I think, very satisfying for the team. It's cool. Yeah, I know it's helped me as well. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of touching also on, you know, that's uh, pri personal kind of uh, technology use and, and tailoring that to a point that we feel comfortable with. Also, there is security and privacy, which is also about comfort when it, when it comes to technology. We want to feel like we're using technology and that it's that we're protected within that bubble. And obviously, that's a huge part of what's what's uh, under the hood with with Android 10 and Q here. 50, I think you mentioned 50 or so related security and privacy features yeah. uh, in Q. Yeah. Um, and privacy settings are being moved to the forefront, which I think is great for users, right? We, we always wonder with, you know, with tech companies kind of what's happening with our data in the background and, yeah. and everything. So it's great to have some controls about that. Um, users might kind of wonder like, what uh, what Google actually has to gain from not having access to that data or or allowing users you know to make adjustments to these so easily now what what is what is your take on that what do you think about that I think you know uh, Larry Page talked about ten things that were our focus for Google mm -hmm. and I think those are just as true today and uh, one of the biggest ones is focus on users and everything else will follow yeah I think it's corny but I think it's it's really true. Uh, the goal behind uh, the work we're doing is we really want to just give users transparency and control. You should be able to know uh, who has my data, who can they share it with, and we want to make that really easy. And so what's cool about the cool about the new privacy settings, you can first, you open up settings, it's right there in the top, privacy. Open that up, and within privacy, uh, first, you can look at all the sensitive resources on your device. So let's say your camera. You want to know which apps have access to your camera. You can open it up and it'll show you exactly which ones. You can tap to change. And that's true for all your sensitive resources. So it makes it really easy 
uh, and straightforward to know. Also things like advertising ID. Let's say you want to opt out of advertising. It's a, uh, a top level uh, menu or a top level page. You can just click on ads and uh, you can say, I don't want ads personalization. It's a one touch change. Right. So I think they're, they're all changes which are really designed to put users in control. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, yeah, go for it. So go would on. you switch one of those off uh, mm -hmm. in the privacy settings? I'm assuming that when you would go launch in, if it wanted the yeah. access, it would ask you again as it does now. Like, uh, like the app would say, would you like to have access to the camera kind of thing? Yes. Okay. And you can say no. Right. Like okay. That. The permissions, the runtime permissions changes that came in, oh, I can't remember the release when they first kicked in, you get... I thought it was like a, there, you're not allowed to infinitely ask the user for that. Thing. Oh, that's right. okay, that's good to know. So if the user goes in there and explicitly deactivates it and says, no, I don't want this permission anymore, they're going to be like, oh, let, they're going to be left alone, essentially, from that point forward, because that would have been a user decision to say no. I believe so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, so I, I think there's, there's, there were, at the time, I think there were two attempts. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how the user okay. setting at the settings level yeah, affects that number of times. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I'm yeah. getting over, over right. asked for permissions. And personally, I, I enjoy getting that, that controls. Of course, location permissions is also another aspect of this. And hallelujah, because that's, that's just such, an, such a, a wonderful user-friendly yeah. option to be able to say, mm -hmm. You know, really, app, you only need my navigation or my location uh, information when I'm actually using you. Right. And, you know, I'm sure there are apps that, that benefit from running in the background to the user. The user might actually decide to choose that. But now it's being presented front and center. And the way you're phrasing it uh, by you know, popping it up for the user when they make that decision, it's not a confusing presentation. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes those things can appear like, I don't even know what I'm agreeing to right now. But yeah. I think it's done really well. The, the other thing I like about that is then you can select the use cases that make sense to you instead Absolutely. of what users yeah. used to do, you know, for saving battery or privacy or whatever the reason was, they just use the heavy hammer and turn off location entirely, yeah. right? which probably was not creating the right experience from, for them for some of the applications that actually could have benefited from that in yeah. a way that the user would have appreciated. Right? Sure. Instead, they're like, no, 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 you don't need that when you're running in the background, but I, you know, this other app, it makes sense to me. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we get back, we're going to talk more about security because there is a ton of that in Android Q after this break. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring used to be hard. All those challenges, multiple job sites, stacks of resumes to sift through, a confusing review process just to manage all of those resumes. Uh, but today, hiring can be easy, and you only have one place to go to get it done. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. ZipRecruiter makes everything easy. They send your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. Uh, but that's not all. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter actually scans thousands of resumes for you to find people with the right experience and then invite them to apply to your job. They might not have even seen your job before, yet they totally qualify so you can reach those people. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter will analyze each one and then, of course, spotlight the top candidates so you never miss a great match. It's like you have a partner in finding the right person for you. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate through the site within the first day. And it really is easy. My wife, she owns a business. She's hired through ZipRecruiter, and she was pretty amazed at how fast these qualified candidates actually came in, how easy it was for her to kind of manage the whole setup, the whole system, uh, in order to reach out to these people and ultimately hire. It was a really wonderful experience for her. Right now, you can check it out for yourself. All About Android listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at our exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash android. Go there and you'll show your support for this show and ZipRecruiter. That address again, ziprecruiter.com slash android. One more time, ziprecruiter.com slash android. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire, and we thank them for their support of All About Android. So uh, one thing I want to ask you about, Chet, is uh, scoped storage, yes. which uh, I've definitely, like, I've, I've read about this, and in some ways, you know, I've heard people say, okay, well, this is how iOS does, does things as far as, like, locking down the file, the file structure between apps to make it more secure, and it sounds to me like a very security-minded 
um, decision to make with Android. And I know there have been some changes recently where initially it seemed like maybe sure. scope storage was going to be more of a, more of an active feature in queue. Now it seems like possibly it's go, it, developers are given more yeah. time to adapt to it, uh, possibly into R or 11, right. wh whatever you guys decide to name it. Um, what can you tell? What can you tell me about that? Very interesting story. It, it's Actually, it's a really good way to understand how we do development on Android overall in a couple of different aspects. One is that um, as the ecosystem evolves, as the platform evolves, and as users and developers evolve, we realize the things that, you know, for privacy's sake, for users' sake, we need to change. That's the painful part. It's not the policies that we're implementing. It's the policies that we used to have that need to change for privacy of users, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when you, you hit... Um, some interesting discussions with developers about, wait, 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 I need this because of the following reason. So that's where the other interesting aspect of, of platform development on Android kicks in, which is we do these preview releases. We really want to do the right thing for both users as well as developers. Okay. So we do previews, we release them out there, we say, here's our initial take on how these things are going to work. And in most cases, outside of, of this particular feature, which is a great example, they sort of take it on, they say, okay, we understand this thing, here's new functionality for us to use, maybe they give us some feedback on what, what would work better for them. When we really hit a wall with them where they're like, oh, no, 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 here's why this doesn't work for us, then we have a chance to iterate through uh, other alternatives. So we put out these changes in the beta one release and we got feedback, really strong feedback in beta one and beta two from developers that said, okay, here are all the things that we're doing that make this a really difficult change for us to absorb immediately. So what can you do about that? Mm -hmm. um, so then in the beta 2.5 release, um, we made pretty strong changes that made it easier for developers to adopt these changes going forward. So initially, I believe that some of the decisions were, okay, these changes take place on the queue runtime. And one of the decisions that we made was, okay, these changes will take place when you target queue, right? And there's a distinction for application developers between an application that is running on a queue device versus an application that actually targets queue behavior. Mm -hmm. right? It's a compile time setting when they, when they build their app. So if they actually opt into the new behavior, Storage is not alone. If they want to take advantage of some of the other uh, behavior on queue, they would target the queue release. And if they're doing that, then they need to adopt these new policies. If they're not, uh, then they basically have time to migrate before they, they target queue or later releases. And then we also made some other changes along the way. They, were, they used to be using one permission um, setting, the location permission, and, and we were requiring them to use other new permissions. Um, and that was a little bit hard for them to, to get into that mode. So we said, okay, here's a migration path, or actually more of a compatibility path where, okay, you can continue using that permission. In addition, you need to take the following approaches. Use that API with this permission, and it makes it a much easier migration path that, mm -hmm. that feels like the right compromise with the developer community. Yeah, Chet's absolutely right. It's actually a, it's a great opportunity to step back and talk about Android's philosophy about how we think about changes from release to release. So the platform's always evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we have a big developer community that we love. I mean, Android's uh, lifeblood has always been developers from the start. And so Android's uh, philosophy around what we call breaking changes, or uh, changes that affect developers, is that we, uh, we always look to minimize them, have as little uh, as possible, if, if not none as possible. And so when you, look at, uh, uh, when you look at the history of Android, we've been really, really careful on that. And I think that's something developers have appreciated. Uh, we have actually an API council that reviews all our APIs for consistency and also to minimize changes. Uh, when you look at a release like Q, I think it's a great uh, opportunity to talk about, uh, we look to minimize the changes where we can. Uh, when we do make breaking changes, like for instance, uh, some of those location changes, we'll, we can talk more about those. Those are going to affect some developers. We always give the longest possible notice period. Uh, so long notice period because people have their own businesses. They want to take those into consideration. Um, three, as soon as we release them, we try to give all the information we possibly can up front because if something's going to affect you, you want to know about it. It's a very considerate sure. thing to do. And then I think uh, Chet's point about scope storage is fantastic. We then uh, use things like the betas and the developer previews to get a lot of feedback. And that helps us figure out how to fine tune those changes. And I think uh, the 2.5 release is a fantastic example where developers really helped us find the um, uh, kind of the optimal, uh, the optimal solution there.
Uh, so I think it's a it's something we uh, will continue to think about, but our commitment to minimizing uh, those types of breaking changes is absolutely unchanged. We're really very committed to that developer community and making sure things are uh, as seamless as possible for them. Yeah. Um, downloads, audio, music folders, those sorts of things, those are still yes. shared shared access in the traditional sense when this all goes into mm -hmm. place, or is that going to change? No, so some of those were, were changed. And uh, again, it depends on, well, if you're if you are an installed application already and therefore not targeting the queue release, then that is unchanged. As soon as you target queue, there are some changes yeah. where, yes, you can get access to those, but here is the approach. And it's a combination of you need this permission and you also need to use the following API to get access to the media file. Right. Yeah. Got to kind of balance both sides. Yeah. Not always that right. easy. No. <laughs> Turns out platform development is yeah. tricky. Yes, it yeah. could be a I, Especially, like Steph brought up this point, this is... Um, critical to to Android being the platform that, that and the product that people want is compatibility, right? We can't if on any release we said, you know what, these methods don't make sense. We're just going to remove them. Then all the applications on the store that use those, all the applications that users have installed and they like to use, would simply crash, mm -hmm. right? So it is important that when we have methods in the API, when we have um, things that developers need to use they stay around there to the extent that they can. And for the most part, they do. They stay around basically forever because we don't want to just arbitrarily start crashing applications. That's not what we're about. Right? So we have to take very measured steps and say, OK, applications are doing this. We need to migrate them to a new world. How can we get them there for the sake of users? Yeah. Um, in most cases, like outside of you know, privacy, where occasionally we need to, to make some of these hard decisions, um, things just stay around and, and, and compatibility just stays, right? Like maybe there's a better way to do that, but there's not a good enough reason for us to yank that method out from under the application and cause it to fail. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, dark mode. Let's transition to that a little bit, yeah. away from the, the heavy stuff of security and all that into uh, something that I think is just probably more like a fan favorite, would you say? I mean, I feel like dark mode has been a discussion among Android it's users. the gothic princess of Google I.O. <laughs> <laughs> People do like it. I noticed that was the first big applause break during yes. uh, your approach yesterday. <laughs> really happy about that. All, all it takes is dark mode to get people happy. So um, what, what's been the biggest challenge in, in bringing this? Yeah. It's, it's been uh, out there for a while that people have been, been hoping for this and realize it's not easy. I think dark mode was just fun. Have yeah. you turned it on yet? Yeah. Uh, I'm cool. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's great. He's on the beta. And and once it kind of loops into you know all the well, obviously Google's yep. Google's apps yep. itself. But once that starts to control third party apps, yep. that's going to be kind of magical. It is. I think uh, uh, so. You know, obviously the keynote is so short, we don't have time to talk about all the right. fun yeah. stuff. Yeah. But uh, so dark mode will uh, will ship all the major Google apps with dark themes at launch. Should check out calendar and photos. Look really cool. Yeah, it uh, looks good. It looks yeah. awesome. Um, and then for, there's a lot of apps already out there that have dark mode. Uh, in fact, right. a lot of my favorite podcasting apps uh, already both have dark mode. Twitter's got a dark mode, so you can take a look at a lot of these apps. Uh, Slack just added a dark mode. And uh, as long as apps have been using our compatibility libraries, which are built into mm -hmm, Jetpack mm -hmm. and following Android best practices, that'll integrate uh, relatively seamless apps. Should definitely still test it but uh, should be straightforward. Uh, the other thing, we, we really wanted to make it easy for developers. So one of my personal favorites is the fact that if you have a, um, uh, don't have a dark mode yet, uh, have you, has anyone talked to you about the ability to create a dark mode? Well, I know that there's a way to kind of do a reverse yes. of yeah. some sort. Yes. Uh, of some sort. That's the key. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, do you want to talk it's about It's technical this? jargon, it's really cool. I realize. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So um, uh, under the, the, the technical way you do it is you, you, uh, in the app, every app has a, what's called a manifest file. Right. So you just drop a line of code in the manifest. And what the OS will do is it'll take, what's technically doing is taking what we call the view hierarchy. Uh, it's inverting the colors. And so you get a basic dark mode if you're a developer. And that's a nice transition, I think, so you can try it out and take a look. I think a lot of apps will implement their own custom dark mode, but it gives you a nice way to get started and kind of see how dark theming will look in your app. Well, the, one of the cool things, two, two of the cool things, one is that, um, uh, so the manifest flag that Steph mentioned, a little techie detail, is called force dark. It's, it's not actually the dark side of the force. It is, it is force dark, just to be clear, mm -hmm. just a coincidence. Kylo Ren um, showed us. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, the other part is, so 
attempts have been made at this in the past because wouldn't it be nice if we could just invert the whole UI on right. the system? And it turns out that's really problematic because there are a lot of images yeah. Yeah. on the system, right? And as soon as you see an inverted image, you're like, that is not a UI that I want. And the images crop up in really subtle ways. They can be sort of muted mm -hmm. backgrounds to things as well. And as soon as you see this, you're like, okay, that's not the approach. We can't do that. However, some very clever engineers worked on it so that they can actually detect a lot of those situations mm. and do the right thing for images, keep those not inverted. And so it'll actually work correctly in a lot of situations. So what you can do as a developer, so the, the correct approach as a developer to dark mode is you need to change your assets. You need to make sure to you know, align yeah. what your UI looks like in this dark mode. So there's going to be some amount of error. But if you want to take a quick run at it and get something simple out there, you can try force dark and see if it works for your situation. Yeah, and the end goal is it's not just to have the OS have a dark theme, right. but by making sure that uh, more and more apps have this, the goal is that you're getting this dark theming across the whole OS. Yeah. So. And more people are served yeah. too to have that ability because I I know like at night I want everything in dark mode because I would like to still read yeah. on my phone you know maybe something through Chrome but not have to like be blasted by a white yeah background well and not to mention the battery the battery savings depending oh, on oh, with, oh, with OLED that you being have. in use yeah. these days yeah, yeah absolutely using the uh, the forced dark mode can that be the starting point yeah like right. That, that's well, like the basic foundation, then it's like, okay, I'm running it, and everything looks okay, except this part, this is totally wrong. I, I think it's probably more that that is a way that you could have it while you work on the While you work solution. on the official version, right. got it, okay. Uh, because I don't think you're going to then incrementally introduce yeah. things, but maybe this can be out there in the meantime while you yeah. work on the real one. All right. Yeah, the battery savings you mentioned too is it's pretty cool. Uh, we've been running uh, early tests on the battery savings, and. Within individual apps, we're finding that when they're in a dark theme, you can save 50 to 60% of battery within that. That's huge. <laughs> now, of course, it, uh, your overall battery savings is really going to depend on how much you have, which apps you're in, and uh, right. what your display usage patterns, but it's really cool. Yeah. It sounds so. like one of those things that shouldn't be right, that you know, the <laughs> color actually affects the power usage. But then if you think of like the white pixels mm -hmm. being, well, there's you know, a couple of million little tiny light bulbs that I just turned on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it adds up over the course of uh, you know the day. Uh, it's the energy of a black star, on entire display. Versus, absolutely. versus the galaxy, which is nothingness. <laughs> Vast. Just put that in perspective. Uh, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about gestures because that's a that's a hot topic as well after this break. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by CashFly. Twit is so familiar with CashFly. We've been using them for years. Uh, give your users the seamless online experience that they want. You can power your site or app with CashFly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, you can give your customers the fast downloads that they need with CashFly. And these days, the fast downloads that they expect. Thankfully, CashFly is there to deliver that. CashFly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. It's backed by a 100% SLA. Uh, CashFly actually guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they happen to be, what device they're on. Uh, there are no limitations. Join the thousands of others who trust CashFly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, and Ars Technica. Uh, Leo has been, you know, Leo's been a huge fan of CashFly for years. Like I said at the beginning, we've been hosting all of our podcasts, our audio, our video content, all that stuff on CashFly for nearly a decade. Every month, our viewers and listeners uh, download petabytes of data fast and flawlessly. Leo says that Twit simply would not exist without CashFly, and that is the truth. So say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week, or worse, even daily, trying to track your CDN usage. With CashFly, you get no billing spikes. You get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs uh, based on yearly usage trends. On average, customers who switch to CashFly will actually save more than 20%, and you can imagine what you could do with that 20% and your time, which might even be more valuable. And just for Twit listeners, CashFly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. You can learn more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank CashFly for their continuous support throughout the last 10 years and for supporting all about Android. 
Uh, everybody's kind of doing their own take on gestures these days. Obviously, with the last year's release with Pi, mm -hmm. kind of gestures within the, the Pixel phone and, and Android uh, kind of had its start. And of course, everybody instantly went to look for the thing that they could complain about, which was the fact that there was the pill, but there was still a back button. And why is that back button there? But we still want back in Android. Now this time, gestures are being tweaked Again, there, there's a couple of options I noticed in the settings. You yeah. can go like partial gesture, yeah. or you can go full-on gesture. I can't remember how it was phrased in there, but, I, but I, it made me laugh. Um, and now we've got the, the back swipes coming from the sides. Uh, that's an interesting direction. I know, it's not, I know that this is not the first time that we've seen it. I feel like there's other, other manufacturers, maybe it's Huawei, I can't remember who it was mm -hmm, off the top mm -hmm. of my head, who have tried to do this before. I just have never interacted with it. So it's taken me a little bit of, yeah. of adjustment. And uh, I don't know, how do, how do users get familiar with this? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean th that's the, the trick of gestures, is making something that, that works. But it always takes a little bit of retraining, right? Yeah, you know, so for Gesture Nav, we did a lot of user studies. We also looked at, there's a lot of different Gesture Nav systems that are really well done in different apps today. Right. We, uh, we looked at that, but ultimately at how people wanted to use the phone. One of the big motivations for Gesture Nav is with a, a new display technology, it was more and more edge to edge glass, and we just wanted yeah. to let people take advantage of all those pixels on the screen. Uh, and you're absolutely right. You can still have your classic three button nav or two button nav, uh, or I've switched to the fully gestural nav situation, or I, of course, really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, I think what we're finding is uh, the system that we've developed is one where users adapt fairly quickly uh, and then find it quite intuitive. The, uh, at the same time, we've tried to preserve concepts in Android that people really like. I don't know if you know this, but uh, people in Android use the back button on average about 100 times a day. I believe it. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, being able to kind of retain those familiar concepts as we built a gestural nav system for the new displays has been, I think, uh, made it very suited to the user base that we have and what they want. Mm. It's, it's interesting that gesture changes are uh, a specific current instance of an overall situation on Android, which is when we do anything in the system UI, that tends to be a really visible change that people talk about because yeah, of course. Uh, I think we call it um, internally, like we moved their cheese. Right? Like we have changed the thing that they use constantly on the device, and therefore it's awful until they get used to it. Old and hopefully we have done the right thing. Sorry? Oh, I was just saying old habits die hard. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they, really do. they really do. And so the, the trick in making any of these changes is what is the right thing for the users, the platform, the system, the direction, um, and the experience versus, no, 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 actually they were correct and this is difficult. And so we, we take really measured step toward, that, uh, toward those things, um, including doing things incrementally. So there was the original approach in the P release and we've gone, as you said, a little bit further now um, in various areas, but we, we need to take things in a direction that we think is correct, um, but also give users, okay, well, you can change it if you really want to, you know, your cheese put back the way it was, but in the meantime, maybe you want to play with this and see if you can get used to it, because we think it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. How, how are the gestures going to trickle down like to other manufacturer devices, um, particularly those devices that are kind of curved on the edges, since that's kind of like a cool thing that happens? <laughs> that's a great question. We, we talked about that in the team, and uh, we, we also got a lot of developer input on that. So I think one thing we think is really important is making sure that for developers, when they're implementing uh, navigation in their apps, that it's standard. Because it's really difficult as a developer to deal with a different devices that have different behaviors. Sure. And so our, our goal with gestural navigation is to have the, uh, the implementations across OEMs be consistent. And that is for developers and also for users so that you get a consistent experience. So one of the tricks to doing that is if, if a manufacturer comes out with their own gestures, let's say, well, they've got a side swipe there. Well, what if there's an application running that has part of its UI mm -hmm. in the area where the user needs to swipe? Well, the, platform that it's running on is probably going to steal that gesture, steal that swipe, and so maybe the user has a hard time getting to that part of the UI. And then the developer needs to know, well, you know, on this class of devices, or maybe they need to change their UI just because it is a subset of the market. It's really difficult to deal with that situation. So if we can do something at the platform level, like now that we're dealing with gestures, we're 
we're figuring out how to plumb that through at the platform level to say, okay, there are set aside areas and here's how you can work around those as an application. Like if you really need access to this, you can tell us this is a set aside for your UI. And then that implementation, because it's Android and it's open source and this is what manufacturers base their stuff on, then they can use that same implementation. So now the user application is going to look and work correctly on AOSP Android, but also on these other devices, because now there's a mechanism that is ecosystem wide instead of vendor specific. Interesting. I, I'm realizing I didn't touch on something earlier that, that uh, you know, we, we already talked about security and privacy and everything like that. I totally miss Project Mainline. Yeah. And oh, Mainline yeah. is super fascinating to Mainline's me. I feel like it's, it's kind of next, you know, next level project trouble, yes, I suppose. Exactly. Yep. I mean, I mean yep. it's related. It's, well, yeah, it's related. definitely okay. related. Um, I guess, tell us a little bit about how, how this is going to work. I know that carriers are allowed to opt out of it. And anytime I hear that, I'm like, but damn it, they're the ones that are gonna opt out of it. And then the, we're not gonna see the true benefits of something like this. So what is Mainline designed to do? And how do we convince carriers to not opt out of such a great feature? Yeah. Do you want to take it or you want me to? Uh, go ahead. Sure. So. So I think Mainline uh, is, it's an incredible uh, technology challenge. Well, I think what it means for you is you're going to get updates on your phone really fast. Right. Uh, and so you think about something like uh, security sensitive parts of the OS, like for instance, the media stack. We can now, because we've componentized the OS, we can deliver those to you directly. Uh, in terms of working with OEMs, we've been partnering really closely with them in the design of Mainline. And for them, it's a, it's a huge advantage too because of course for, for them as well, they want users to be able to get those updates very quickly. And so if we can do it in a way that is uh, seamless with their systems, but means we can uh, deliver, for instance, security fixes to, mainla uh, to a component like media, or one of my personal favorites is time zone. I can talk about that in a bit and how it works. Uh, it's a huge benefit to, to them as well. Uh, so mainline is something we're, we're just really excited about. I think uh, security is a place where it, you can see an immediate benefit for users. But let me talk about actually time zone because I think that also shows sure. the benefit of this model. So have you ever gone to a new country and all of a sudden your phone is in the wrong time? Yes. Okay. This has happened to me too. So what's happening is countries have different time zone rules and occasionally those time zone rules change. So you fly into country right. X. They've changed their time zone rules, and if you haven't had an OS update since then, the OS doesn't know what time it is. So all of a sudden, you're an hour late or an hour early. Uh, and so I think one of the, uh, this is a, a subtle, but I think great illustration of mm -hmm. something like Project Mainline. Now what we can do is we can uh, directly update the time zones on your phone. And we're doing it behind the scenes in the same way that we deliver updates in apps. So you think about it, your apps just update in the background. Right. And delivering. We're using the same delivery mechanism here, uh, slightly different packaging mechanism. And the, uh, the packages that we're using, we ship publicly. This is all done in open source, so anyone could do it, although we're using the, uh, the Play Store since it's a great distribution mechanism to get them out. So you're using the Play Store, so then a user has, uh, opens up the Play Store, and is that the trigger for the update, or it's just happening in the background because you have the Play Store installed on your device? The updates will happen in the background. So as a user, you don't even know that something happened. You just know that... Uh, Google, Google's got my back. Yeah, will, will there be a notification or anything that says five things updated? Yeah. Uh, By the way, you're safer now. Yes. I just wanted you to know. Uh, we'll, we'll have more details on the user yeah. experience, but yes, as a user, you'll always be able to see what updates have happened on your phone and be notified as they're, as they're taking place. From the engineering side, it's, it's an interesting direction to go in for Android in how we work with manufacturers and partners. Mm -hmm. uh, you linked it to, to Project Treble, which is um, appropriate. It's I think of it as modularizing the OS more, yeah. where you can think of early Android as being a blob that manufacturers would download from open source, and then they would apply their special sauce to to get their own UI, to get their own functionality for their devices, their drivers, um, maybe fixes they had for specific you know chips that they were using, whatever it is. And then we come out with the next release, and it is basically our next version of our blob. They would download that, and again, they would go to all that work to do that, right? And they don't really want to do that. They don't want to spend that effort basically redoing that every time we release our next version of whatever. If we can start to componentize things and make it easier for them to say, yeah, we don't care about that area, the time zone functionality, um, and there's a very clear interface of how they plug into that, then it's much easier for them to update the stuff that they actually care about mm -hmm. um, without saying, 
you know, well, here's a blob. We can't update everything in time. Therefore, we're not going to update these devices. Instead, they could more easily provide updates, or we could provide updates for the things that they don't need to special sauce. And, it, and then it makes it much easier for the ecosystem to, to keep up to date. Yep. So at the very least, if somebody doesn't, maybe is not getting the latest version of Android because of a carrier holdback or whatever is going on, mm -hmm. then at least some of those security elements and like the time zones and the little nuancey things of the system will be at least updated. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I imagine it would it would apply to really critical things though. This is probably not the kind of thing that happens with like, oh, we decided to slip this random thing like. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I see this from my perspective. It seems like this is the kind of approach that is used when there is something major that just hit, and this is just the way to get that update to users as quickly as possible, but probably not something less priority. I think one of the things that we often think about is we, we want to both deliver, uh, we want to give users what they want, so that means being able to deliver things like critical security fixes, uh, as well as providing OEMs, the, uh, really the ability to customize. And so I think you'll continue to see you know, OEMs building their own wonderful experiences on top of Android, but Mainline gives us a way to uh, update those kind of core system components like security or time zones. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, quick break, then we're gonna come back and talk about a little bit more of the developer stuff oh, cool. that, uh, that was announced, because we definitely have a lot of developers watching this show, and we want to make sure that you get your information as well. So we'll be back right after this break. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by LegalZoom. If you own a business, you already know owning a business is hard. It's a lot of hard work. Running a small business, uh, you just got work coming at you from all directions. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to be the master of all of it. It takes time and money, and you want all the time and money you have to go towards growing your business, of course. Uh, but what happens when legal hurdles pop up along the way? You might not be a legal expert. That's why LegalZoom is there to help. Nearly 2 million Americans have used LegalZoom to start their businesses with LLCs, incorporation, and more. Even after your business is set up, LegalZoom can still help you out. Things like lease agreements, changing tax laws, contract reviews, they're all part of running your own business. And these are precisely the kinds of costly hurdles that can take time away from growing your business. If, if legal isn't your strength, Put it in the hands, or at least allow someone to come in and help you hold your hand through through it so that you know you can do the things that you're the best at, running your business, and uh, kind of let some of that legal thinking be helped uh, alongside you with LegalZoom. That's why LegalZoom created their business legal plan, to help you through it. Get advice for running your business from vetted independent attorneys and tax professionals available in all 50 states. And the best part is you're not going to get charged by the hour like you might expect since LegalZoom is not a law firm. Uh, LegalZoom is fantastic. I've used them for years. Uh, I got my uh, will and testament done when we had our first daughter. It was a super simple process. We've still got the whole binder at home stored away in a safe place. Just a really nice presentation. The whole process was flawless and enjoyable. Uh, so you can check it out for yourself and apply this to your business. Make your time and money work for you. Check out LegalZoom's business legal plan at LegalZoom.com now and get special savings when you enter AAA at checkout. That's LegalZoom.com, and make sure and enter AAA for special savings. LegalZoom, where life meets legal, and we thank LegalZoom for their support of All About Android. All right, so let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit to, to the developer stuff with the okay. limited time that we have left. I'm sorry about that. There's, there's always too much to fit in mm -hmm. within an hour. That's usually how it works anyways. Uh, Kotlin has been the darling, and this, is, yep. um, you know, this has been the last couple of years. This, the Kotlin uh, popularity has been rising within Google. That's obvious. Yep. This is the first year where you, you flat out said in your post, you said you want to develop your apps with Kotlin yep. if you want all of the latest uh, and greatest first. Yeah, so we are coming out with some of the new stuff in, in Jetpack libraries, these uh, mm. static libraries that we ship um, and APIs, and some of those are coming out with enhanced functionality for Kotlin developers. Things like Coroutine that provide better uh, concurrency um, supports, and just APIs can be more elegant in Kotlin. So we are still doing stuff, you know, the core platform remains in the Java programming language, those APIs are not changing. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that we can, maybe we'll be introducing more functionality and APIs in Kotlin because in some situations it is the right thing to do. 
Yeah, you also um, you also talked a little bit about the ways uh, that Google is educating yep. around this to bring more developers into the Kotlin fold. Uh, a number of different aspects. Why? Yes. Um, so there's something that we're doing with JetBrains. Actually, it's going to kick off. I think this summer called Kotlin Everywhere. It's this global series of events that you can opt mm. into to have it you know show up in your neighborhood and participate in that. Mm -hmm. Um, these are sort of mini conference tutorial things, um, but we've also just launched a, a course. I think it's developing Android apps with Kotlin, and we've got other great code labs and courses, investing more in docs and, and uh, tutorials, code labs, training samples, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. We've always been great at educating, you know, educating people yeah. who want to get into this. It's the first step. I mean, I think a lot of people are, you know, they're self-educating and they're already there, but for the people that, you know, have been unable to do that so far, we do want to make it easier for them to get on the same page. Sure, sure. Uh, speaking of Kotlin, of course, you mentioned Jetpack. Jetpack Compose, I yes. think, uh, is very, uh, very interesting. Now, yes. I am not a developer, but everything that I read about this, this all has to do with uh, the unbundled UI toolkit, right? Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about, um, what, what did I read? UI as code uh, as, <laughs> as a way to approach yeah, this. Both declarative and, and more code-centric. Let me start with some of the motivations for it, right. um, which is our UI toolkit, like a lot of Android is, what, 12 years now, old now? Uh, started yeah. development in 2006, the portions that we basically still maintain, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, at some point in the lifetime of an application platform, you need to say, okay, well, do we need something new, right? Because as I mentioned, compatibility is really critical, right? So we can't fundamentally change the things that people are using, but if those things are too difficult to use, then we're kind of painted into a corner, right? So you sort of step to the side and say, continue using those, those will continue to work as they, as they do today. But in the meantime, we'd like to offer something new that is maybe a more elegant and easier approach. Um, and one of those things that the community has bubbled up in the, in the last few years is um, reactive approach to programming, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is different where you basically declare, you say, at any point in time, here's what I want my UI to look like. Instead of having really tricky logic all over your app that says, oh, change the state of this thing over here, and then, oh, if this state changed, then make a callback over the, and it ends, tends to be a really complex network of, of interactions in your code. Instead, you say, you've got this one flow that says, no, no, this is what the UI should look like when any of these other things change anywhere else. And it allows like you to- UI first. Uh, sure, I like that phrase anyway. Um, UI should always be first. Um, but it separates the data from the UI, so you, you handle the logic of your application elsewhere, and when that changes, then it automatically goes through this flow and through this declarative code that you, you've put together, it says, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna paint the UI here. Hmm. Um, so, Oh, I know a lot of developers are using this in different ways already, in different platforms, in different um, contexts like the web or whatever, and now we'd, we'd like to give them that opportunity to use it, A, on Android, B, using Kotlin, uh, and um, C, using the rest of the platform APIs and the rest of their application code that they already have. So we want to integrate these, these newer concepts of program with the, the platform that they already uh, like to target. Uh, is this production app ready? Like, like Absolutely be... not. <laughs> no. Early, early, early days. So what we did yeah. at I.O. was we announced that we have been working on this for a while already internally, and we have now opened it up. We're going to be developing this in the open in AOSP. Um, so there's a link that uh, we posted yeah. at Google I.O. in the okay. sessions. Um, so there, there's two sessions that give a, a brief glimpse into how this works, uh, and then through the link uh, posted in those sessions, you can get to the open source and check it out. Download it, play with it, but absolutely don't ship an app on it right now. It is really early days right. on this. Mm -hmm. You can see that same theme, as, that was a great description, you can see that same theme of compatibility coming through here in Compose and Kotlin, the same theme we talked about at the beginning. We love developers, and we have a huge developer base, and so when w we think about uh, things like Compose, what you see is it's designed to be really friendly to all developers that we have today. So first, all of the Kotlin APIs that we have, Kotlin itself is uh, completely interoperable with the Java programming language. So those APIs are very uh, friendly to anyone who's writing in the Java programming language. And the same thing with Compose. Compose is designed to be completely interoperable with the existing view system. So I, across the board, what you can see is the intention is uh, we want to just have a really developer-friendly approach. So if you want to keep doing things the way you're doing, if you already have a large uh, code base, which a lot of our developers do, uh, we want to uh, 
make everything possible and in fact continue to make developers lives easier there too. So we're investing in those parts as well as as Chet said, and I think he said it really well, we also want to take advantage of some of these like amazing new ideas uh, to kind of take the next leap. So for people who are coming onto the platform or are ready to try something new, they can really get this kind of quick and seamless way of doing it. Sometimes I think of the difference between like C++ and uh, Kotlin is like, uh, it's like you can get somewhere in a horse-drawn carriage or you can take like the TGV in France and like you get there, one of them's bumpier and one of them goes really fast and it's super cool. Um, and uh, the idea is we want, we want both those paths to exist. Uh, but we do, you know, like new technology is great and sometimes it's fun and cool to go, go somewhere taking advantage of all those, those uh, new concepts. Sure. Uh, in app updates, that's, that's yes. something that was announced last year, limited limited partners were able to kind of get to using right. that. Yes. Now it's kind of open for everyone, right? Yeah. Right, so we talked about that at the Android Developer Summit, yeah. I think, uh, and it has been beta with limited um, uh, people accessing it since then, and it just went 1.0 this week, mm -hmm. uh, our general availability. Um, so you can get that. So the, uh, that's the ability for, like you've got a really important bug fix that you want to get to your users. Wouldn't it be nice if you could give that option for them to update um, or, or have them update before they happen to see that there's an update in the Play Store. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can actually tell them next time they launch the app, it basically says you need to take this update now, you know, we're, we're gonna do an install. Um, or you give them the option and say, an update is available, would you like to have this now or would you rather wait mm -hmm. until later? Um, so flexible API, but, but really that, that ability to sort of push something that's really important to your users. Um, in, in a more timely manner than the normal Play Store update mechanism. While yeah. still letting the user decide if it's time to update or not. Yeah, the, the relaunch, I'm, I'm wondering through, one of the flows I thought was, I think it was mandatory. There, I know that there, there are separate flows where you can sort of give them the option. Mm -hmm. um, there must be an option. I, I honestly can't remember, Tor showed the, the first option. Uh, in his demo yesterday. Yeah, so for inline updates, that's exactly right. There's, um, uh, there's uh, one option where you can uh, provide the update to the app in the background, and then the user can uh, opt to restart. And then there's another where the user kind of clicks to uh, directly apply the update, and it will restart the app immediately. So uh, they're both, both options, and the developer can choose uh, which one they'd like, depending on which they think is most appropriate for the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, uh, I feel like we've covered a lot, yet we haven't covered nearly enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy because there's always so much stuff. Uh, kind of the, the final thing that I wanted to just throw at you real quick, and I realize it's kind of out there and a little esoteric, but five years ago, we would be looking forward and we'd be looking at something like maps with the AR functionality embedded in it where the camera pass through and gives you the little pinpoint in real, you know, kind of in real life right in front of you. Five years ago, that would have seemed kind of like out there, that would have seemed kind of sci-fi, like, wow, Android's gonna be able to do that in five years. Um, without giving anything away, like, w you know, like use your imagination, where, where would you like to see mobile in five years? What are the things that five years from now you would love to see someone, you know, <laughs> to see in someone's hands going, I can't believe we can do that with our mobile device, but we can now, and that's awesome. I always feel too humble to talk about, you know, like the next, I, I think it's, you have to kind of take a humble approach when you look at how technology is evolving. Yeah. But when I look at a feature like live caption, I think it's yeah. so incredibly cool to look at a place where you can see, you know, ML, like just to nerd out for a second, you're talking about something that was once a two gigahertz finite state transducer mm. model running in the cloud. Now it's running in 80 megabytes completely on device. Fascinating. Um, but, you know, setting the technology aside, what's more cool is now you're talking about a half a billion people uh, for whom uh, content, so much of the content on the phone is now accessible. And I think uh, looking, at, uh, looking at ML and machine learning done in this really privacy first way, it's amazing to see, I think something like live caption shows how helpful that can be. I think it'd be really cool to see uh, how that helpfulness evolves and how we can make mobile even more helpful. Yeah, if we're there right now, which is amazing. That's such, I'm yeah. so happy you brought that up because that, that was one of the wowie features, right, mm -hmm. that you saw on stage. And we've been seeing a little bit of this in YouTube as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Is that kind of, did that kind of inform a little bit of the smarts behind what's happening on a platform level? That's a, that's a great question. So uh, yeah, YouTube uh, now captions all of its content, yeah. uh, which is, right. I think, really cool. Uh, what's great about live caption is people record a lot of 
con there's a lot of content that's recorded without captions. Like, you know, let's say I recorded a video and sent it to you. Uh, now you can caption that. And especially one of the things people don't think about your podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, podcasts believe me, yeah. Are not captioned. Um, and a lot of social media now embeds video. And so with captioning, all of that becomes very accessible. And that's, I think, not just for, uh, uh, it's really for everyone. Let's say yes. you, you know, you're sitting on an airplane, you want to watch it. Yeah. Makes it really easy. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Uh, really appreciate you guys sitting down with us today. Yeah. This is always, like I said, the highlight of uh, one of the highlights of my year uh, doing the show, the chance that we get to sit down in the Google campus and talk with people who we, we really look look up to your work and appreciate what you do. So thanks. Uh, thanks for sitting down with us. Chet Haas, developer advocate uh, for Android, and Stephanie Cuthbertson, uh, senior director for Android. Thank you again. Thanks and I uh, hope we can talk with you again next year. Thank you so much. Great. And that is it for this week, Flo. Thank you uh, for hopping in. Tomorrow you're going to talk with Hiroshi on no stage. No big deal. No big deal. Uh, so that's going to happen. Uh, I'm sure you can find that on live on, you, uh, on YouTube uh, if you want to check it out. So we do this show uh, normally every Tuesday, 5 o'clock Pacific time. We do it live at twit.tv slash live. We are, you know, this week's a little different, but next week we'll be back at our normal time. Regularly we're definitely scheduled talk time. Yes, normally <laughs> we're going to talk more about Google I.O. stuff. because We have we've got so much more, more to unpack. A few more days here and we did not get to all of it. No. And I'm sure Ron has opinions as well. So next week, new episode of All About Android, twit.tv slash AAA if you want to find all the information about this show. And again, thanks to the folks at Google for uh, allowing us to do this interview. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, Flo. I had a lot of fun, Jason. All right. And send us your questions about Google I.O. That's what next week's for. Yeah, AAA at twit.tv. That's it, everyone. We'll see you next week on another episode of All About Android. Bye.